Okay, spiral time. This is gonna be a general review with like no spoilers going into some light spoilers, ending off with some full spoilers. I'll be very clear when those moments are gonna change over, but first a brief history. Okay, I really wanted to wear my dead tired hoodie for this, but it is like unusually warm today. Like it snowed this weekend. Anyways, so the mid 2000s were absolutely marked by a particular brand of horror. The ones that seemed to push the voyeuristic forms of violence and blood and torture and were constantly working to one up themselves for the sake of shock value. The gore horror movies or the torture porn flicks. And at the forefront pioneering this trend of movies were Saw and Hostel, both of which incidentally premiered at film festivals and both significantly got worse the longer their franchises ran. Hostel 2 was literally banned in a number of countries with one scene in particular being removed in different areas. But the first Saw, in my opinion, is a genuinely great psychological horror with a lot of great thriller elements and amount of brutality that doesn't seem as over the top as it might have initially appeared. It's obviously more excessive than a lot of other horror movies, but the overall ideas presented are pretty damn solid. Jake Saw's motivations make sense, but he's still obviously a psychotic serial killer. But a lot of what makes that first movie so great is the stuff you don't see and how it ends up revealing things to you. It's great. And for those who don't remember, Jigsaw is a terminally ill man who sets up these traps where he places people he feels are wasting their lives to fight for the right to continue living, hoping that it'll give them a new lease on life and some kind of twisted self-help plan. But these traps are often so brutal and gruesome and violent that the average person, even if they want it to die wouldn't just sit there and let it happen to them. I'm gonna give you PTSD so hard that if you actually make it through it, your will to live will wane even more. And that's why he's psychotic and it seems to have some pretty solid results with certain people. Like when that first movie ends and he's the guy who's been dead the entire time on the floor and then you realize that the main character's chance at salvation went down the drain the second the movie started, oh my God. But then everything starts getting worse. I was planning on doing an entire retrospective with these movies, but I kind of ran out of time before Spiral came out. If you're interested in that, let me know and maybe I'll do it so that it lines up with the release of this on digital. Cause I dropped off after three. I caught parts and like instances that happened in the later ones, but I hadn't actually sat down and watched any of them since the third. Because it just hard steered into the direction of how messed up can I make this movie and still get an R rating. Overall, the franchise starts feeling like pretty little liars with the never ending who's A. Except now it's who's Jigsaw? Is there more than one? Are there unknown assistants? Will they fight each other to be the dominant Jigsaw? Some of them are gonna follow the ideal that John put in place, but others will use it to just create unbeatable traps because they want people to die horrible deaths. It also got kind of confusing from an outsider looking in because like six came out and then 3D came out, which was not a 3D remake of the first movie or a 3D remake of the third movie. It was the seventh movie and the final chapter. But then seven years later, Jigsaw came out because the seventh movie messed up things so badly that they wanted to try again and that didn't do much better. And then that was supposed to be the final installment, but then Chris Rock decided that he also wanted to be in a Saw movie. Which brings us to Spiral from the Book of Saw, the first new Saw movie since 2017, the ninth installment, and the second attempt to bring it back from the dead with some social commentary necromancy. And yet another movie to be added to the list of movies whose trailers give away part of their mystery. So the next part is just gonna be my spoiler-free thoughts on the movie so you're still safe to watch. Now Rock's presence is a welcome one. He adds a bitter humor to the franchise and also manages to handle the serious stuff pretty well too. Even his awkward handling of some of the emotional stuff just seems like somebody who's not used to dealing with their emotions, not an acting error. <laughs> But overall, the movie just doesn't quite hit the mark. I personally think it's the kind of movie that you should watch with friends. I don't think you get anything from watching this in a theater, but if you were like just sitting around in a basement watching this on a TV with friends, I think you'd have a really good time. It's not bad, but my overall thoughts while watching it was that it felt like a lost episode of Criminal Minds where they didn't tell the new guy that it had to be safe for network television and he just finished filming the scene where somebody got skinned alive. And if you start thinking too hard about any individual thread, a lot of different things just kind of start ripping open. And I can usually ignore that in a lot of cases, but when you're also not nailing the themes that you're trying to express or any of these other little aspects, those like little issues become a lot more glaring. A lot of the comp acting is super weak, even from the actors that I usually find to be quite competent. It lacks the weight that I expect from this style of detective film and it just feels like they were really poorly trying to capture what Zodiac and Seven achieved. Overall, it just doesn't seem to do much with the detective genre, the social commentary aspect, or the Saw concept in general. Even when the movie tries to mislead you, the twists are just so obviously set up that nothing comes across as shocking. And in the end, it doesn't really feel like it does anything with its message of police corruption. Now this movie doesn't pick up from any existing Saw plot point, but rather introduces a copycat killer years later. But this killer doesn't operate under the Jigsaw mantra. These traps don't have the intention of offering people the chance to earn their lives. There isn't a way 
to cleanly make it out of any of these traps and it's completely based in a world of revenge with the expressed desire for police accountability. And I get that revenge becomes a component of the original franchise, but it's whatever. That said, Chris Rock and Max Miela have a pretty decent buddy cop dynamic through most of the movie and Samuel L. Jackson obviously eats up every scene he's in. You wanna play games, motherfucker? All right, I'll play. And there's some genuine comedy that I would honestly take a skit with Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson bouncing off each other rather than this being a serious movie. The traps themselves are pretty basic but still brutal, but probably not enough for people that are specifically watching these movies for that aspect. Though there are a couple scenes where I just did not look. Since I can't show you my in the moment reactions, which is what I originally wanted to do for this movie before I realized it wasn't releasing digitally, here's a little recreation. Oh my god, no. No, not the finger, no. Oh God, no. See what you've all been deprived? But Spyro follows Zeke Banks short for Ezekiel, which I feel like had to be a Pulp Fiction reference considering Samuel L. Jackson plays his dad. Ezekiel 25, 17. But he's a veteran detective who's had a target on his back ever since he turned in a dirty cop earlier in his career. And after one of his only friends on the force ends up killed after following a purse snatcher into an open drain pipe for some reason, Zeke gets roped into what appears to be a copycat jigsaw case after he receives a USB drive with a jigsaw style message from someone who sounds shockingly like Misa Amane in Death Note. <clears throat> I am Kira. So from here, we're going into light spoilers. I won't reveal the killer or a lot of specifics, but I'm gonna go over some of the different traps and how the movie sets itself up. But this first trap occurs so fast in the movie that I had some slight regrets. It was like two minutes in and somebody has their tongue in a vice clamp in a subway and has to jump down and rip out their tongue, otherwise they'll get hit by the train. And because this is a Saw movie, both happen. I'm genuinely surprised they uploaded this clip to YouTube unedited and it somehow doesn't have an age restriction when somebody's bloody tongue is getting ripped out of their face. But Zeke doesn't like playing by the rules. When we meet him, he's on an unauthorized undercover drug bust, even though he works in the homicide department. And what I was not prepared for, even with Chris Rock, was the amount of comedy they throw in. It literally starts with him basically doing a comedy routine around a bunch of criminals about Forrest Gump. The one thing that's truly been missing from the Saw franchise. Though later on, there's a bit of a Twilight joke that I saw someone refer to as dated, but if anything, that is ahead of the game. Twilight is in full swing now. If anything, this movie being delayed helped it and made that passing comment alone is just super on point. It's not a particularly well thought out joke. Somebody needed to bother Zeke's phone and he was all like, hey, don't drain the battery watching Twilight because Twilight's funny. But you know what, fair comment, if it was me, I might have done that. Twilight supremacy taking over. Okay, back to the torture movie. But I feel like this whole scene was established to show that Zeke feels more comfortable around criminals than he does around his fellow officers. Because for the past 12 years, they've had it out for him because he had the audacity to turn in a cop who killed a witness. Sorry murdered a witness, which sadly happens way too much. There's really not much positive about a cop coming forward about something they saw, but he still manages to work his way up to detective either by just putting up with it or the fact that his dad was the police captain at the time of the incident. But here we are, Chris Rock, homicide detective extraordinaire, who's now being forced to take on a rookie partner who's all hopped up on ideology and helping people and says that Zeke's dad is the reason he wanted to be a cop in the first place. So match made in heaven here. Detective Banks, let's get to Yep. But they got a nice little buddy cop thing going. Will's talking about his wife and kid and Chris is like, heh, we'll see how long that lasts. Women aren't like men when they cheat, they'll cheat on you during the day. I just found out the Pilates doesn't exist. You give a woman 600 Tuesdays. It ain't worth three Saturday nights. But it all quickly gives away to the reason we're all here. Fucked up murder traps. So Zeke and Will are called in to deal with the subway murder death, which they don't currently know was a death trap, but there's clearly something weird about it. Now the opening scene explains why he was in this trap. The new pig mask Jigsaw knows this officer has made a career out of lying on the witness stand more than any other officer in the precinct, railroading innocent people. Today. It is you who will be railroaded. So it becomes very obvious that the focus of this movie is the systemic issues within police and how it can weed out and corrupt the people that do genuinely want to do good when it comes to protecting their own. The plot kicks off when a package is delivered directly to Zeke with a flash drive listing out the plans to reform the department, confirming that the man in the subway was a cop. But if it's another copycat, it's gonna be a shit show. After realizing what wall that spiral was painted on, they head to the courthouse and find another package that contains a tongue and the officer's ID badge. I also really appreciate that they wear gloves in this when they touch evidence. I feel like that's just something that so many shows don't do. And I'm so used to cops in these shows always being like, hey, they killed one of our own. It's personal now. But everyone seems to be turning this into a bid to one-up Zeke and get control of the case. But Zeke was actually friends with Buzz, the officer that was railroaded. Even though he was also a dirty cop, he stayed close 
close with Zeke and even their families were close. So when everyone else seems to be sniffing their way in, he gets pissed. We get a full on like, F me, no F you moment. Fuck you. Fuck me. You know, Mrs. Fuck Zeke you. Like and even though Angie wanted to give the case to O'Brien, Zeke fights for it because of how close he was with Boz and you know, the killer kind of hand delivered him a tape that mentioned him. So he should probably be a little involved. But I get the risk. The department doesn't trust him. Turn in one cop who murdered somebody who was willing to testify against a different dirty cop and suddenly you're a pariah. So when these two cops who clearly don't like Zeke get a lead on who Boz followed into the subway, they decide to go it alone and not tell anybody what they found. Which is absolutely stupid. You're dealing with a copycat killer who's specifically targeting cops. You know you've done horrible shit and you're gonna wander into an abandoned warehouse to try to find a meth addict alone. Genius. So he gets a nice personalized little finger trap. So as mentioned, Zeke's dad is the police chief and the current captain was his right hand. So even though they weren't necessarily happy about what happened, they both went to bat for Zeke when he rolled over on that cop. And it's probably why he's still around. But when they were supposed to meet up to go over the case, Sam Jackson is just nowhere to be found, which is unusual because the food he ordered for them to eat while they went over it does show up. Now this is where the concept of a trailer undermining what a movie is trying to accomplish comes into play. So we're gonna do some more spoilers here, but still not reveal the killer. So after the current captain is tricked into her own trap, which was somehow set up in the precinct's evidence room, they really that a chunk of the security footage is missing that would have shown whoever did it leaving. Wouldn't they have the footage of somebody setting up the hot wax death trap in the evidence locker? Whatever, won't get bugged down, but while they don't know who did it, they can see everyone that signed in and somehow the cop that Zeke got fired badge was used to sign in as well as Zeke's dad. But there's just no way that their credentials would still be active. Like one of them literally went to jail. And since his dad is missing, O'Brien's a little suspicious that he might have been involved. But the trailer, which I had not watched until after watching the movie, literally shows Samuel L. Jackson strung up in a trap. And then they just completely release the- You wanna play games, motherfucker? All right, I'll play clip. So if you watch the trailer, that misdirection's already ruined for you. However, I also never really believed that angle. I didn't watch any clips, trailers, or teasers, and I still knew that he wasn't involved. Even when they show a flashback of him pistol whipping Fitch for not showing up when Zeke called for backup, which got him shot, which would be clear motivation for him being sick of crooked cops, the movie already felt like it subverted the expectation of his involvement. Because they also show him seemingly upset that Zeke turned in his partner without calling him first because he couldn't get a hold of him. If anything, who the killer actually is seems very obvious past a certain point, which I'll get to in a second, but sadly by the end, this movie just feels like a lot of failed things. A movie that probably could have stood on its own outside the Saw franchise and had more of an impact because it really fails to capture that same intrigue that the original Saw does, but it also doesn't nail any of those themes that it's aiming for either. It's not quite thrilling or mysterious enough and it's probably not bloody enough for the people that are looking for that side of things. Though it's perfectly gruesome enough for me. I could barely look at the screen when that dude's fingies were being pulled off. But the metaphors were fun with the kills even if the traps didn't seem super inspired. Taking the tongue of someone who perpetually lied on the witness stand and the fingers of someone who shot an unarmed man. They mostly all work in the context of the MO, except the one that doesn't. And it's always the one that stands out that gives you more indications than the ones that are the same. So we're going full spoiler town, baby. I'll leave a timestamp on the screen and down below so you can cut ahead to my final thoughts that will be spoiler free. So this key piece is to let you know who the killer most likely is. As it winds into its conclusion, we find out that the copycat jigsaw killer is the son of the person that Zeke's partner killed, who happened to see the whole thing happen and Zeke made sure he stayed hidden so his partner wouldn't try to do something to him too. And that's why he's been specifically sending the tapes to Zeke, the one cop that he feels has integrity in this precinct. So when Zeke's partner is killed and skinned to make one of these creepy dolls, it doesn't fit the motivation of exposing dirty cops. He's a brand new detective full of ideals, openly working with the guy you're championing when the rest of the force hates him, and you skin him to prove a point? Now I'm not saying I'm looking for a lot of logic, from my serial killers, but for a movie like this, it stood out as unusual. My notes even said skinned partner, why this is the guy. It's also the only kill that doesn't show the person being grabbed or the event happening in detail. We get brief flashes of Zeke imagining what it would have been like for him to be skinned. And it also doesn't appear to be a trap, again, breaking the theme. So we start putting the pieces together. We're told the reason why the cops were able to commit so many offenses on the job is because of a fictional article eight. Something that seemed to give cops the ability to play judge, jury, and executioner without much risk of reprimand. And we're told that Article 8 times were in full swing when Zeke's dad was the captain. And who said Zeke's dad was his inspiration for becoming a detective? That's right, William. Who would have had access to the precinct? 
William. Does it still make no sense as to how somebody could set up a death trap in an evidence locker? Absolutely. But Will was inspired by the corrupt environment that Zeke's dad played a part in creating. There's some other hints too, but that's definitely the big one. Turns out the skin body is just the guy that helped out with that first lure. And William just tattooed the guy's arm with the same tattoo he had so that the cops would think it was him because apparently they just they don't DNA test. But my biggest issue here is the tattoos do not remotely heal fast enough for this plan to make sense. And this is where it starts feeling really stupid and circles hard into network television feels. Max Minghella trying to pull off the villain role so quickly just doesn't work. It kind of felt like the Mark Ruffalo reveal in the Now You See Me movie, but like worse. And if you're wondering why he even bothered joining a police force if he knew which cops he wanted to target and why he specifically wanted to be partnered with Zeke, it's because he wanted to be partnered with Zeke. He wants Zeke to line up the dirty cop so he can take care of them. But I feel like there could have been a better way to go about this. There's also just so much that could have been derailed with minimal changes. Like the moment where Will borrows Zeke's phone and then uses it to lure his dad into a trap. What would have happened if Zeke would have been like, fuck no, use the landline. Either way, we get to the room where Sam Jackson is suspended in the air with his blood quickly draining from his body and the SWAT team is on the way. So Zeke has to make a choice, shoot a target to release his dad or shoot will and watch his dad die. And I feel like there's conflicts just with this premise alone. I feel like there is definitely a way to do both, but whatever, he obviously shoots the target. Then immediately starts beating the shit out of William. And I don't get how this would be a loyalty test. He's obviously going to save his dad. You can't simultaneously be so delusional that you think this guy is going to help you with your murder traps after you put his dad in one and smart enough to set up a murder trap inside a police precinct's evidence room without getting caught. But when the SWAT team shows up, they cut through a wire that resets the trap and engages a secondary component that makes it look like Sam Jackson's gonna shoot them so then obviously they just lay him out and Zeke's just stuck screaming on the floor watching his dad die. Then sees William disappear down an open elevator with a shh as if the SWAT team that's on Zeke wouldn't have also seen that and like gone to where the elevator goes to arrest him. And that ending is where it just really loses it for me. I guess it's normal for Saw movies to end with these like, whoa, crazy moments. But it just felt so stupid when the elevator went down, he just gave the little Arya Montgomery shh. Oh wait, is it, is it a callback to Zeke telling him to shush? Still dub. I also feel like the tie-in to the original Jigsaw just felt incredibly cheap. It's like a throwaway line about how, yeah, you know, I just really resonated with the whole spiral ideology and how it links to life. Like just say you wanted to make some murder traps and be done with it. So yeah, Spiral from the Book of Saw, pretty dope concept to revive this very dead franchise and I just don't think it succeeded. Though part 10 is reportedly in development, making me wonder if they'll explore who Will's dad was willing to testify against. I don't know if the Rocky release of Spiral will afford it enough money to continue. I know a lot of people were really excited for this one because it looked like a fresher take on the franchise, which in a lot of ways it was. But the lackluster reviews may hurt the rollout, especially when people aren't as willing to go to theaters right now, but time will tell. Audience reviews have been steadily going up over the weekend though. Again, dope concept, timely theme, but I don't think it completely commits to what it laid out and that's what makes it so disappointing. You see all the threads of the potential and then it just never quite gets there before it dissolves into this poorly executed conclusion. It also fails to build any kind of genuine tension, which means that the jump scares even fail to be jump scares, which is impressive, honestly. I don't know. I definitely don't hate it. If you're a fan of the franchise, you should definitely watch it, whether you wait for it to come out in digital or not. But if you've never really cared about this franchise at all, I wouldn't necessarily recommend jumping on this unless you just want to watch it with some friends. So that is going to do it for today's video. Let me know what you're thinking down below. If you've managed to see Saw, if you are not going to watch it, if you're really excited for it, if it lived up to those expectations, or if you're just kind of like, what? no, I, this is done. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.